Welcome, everyone. Welcome to the New York Jewish Film Festival. The festival is co-presented by the Jewish Museum and Film at Lincoln Center. I'm Aviva Weintraub from the Jewish Museum, and it's a real pleasure to welcome you to the discussion of our closing night film, The Wonderful Irmi. And I'm thrilled and delighted that we have with us the filmmakers, Veronica Selver and Susan Fanschel, joining us from New York and California. Um, just a few notes before we do get started. Um, I'll be doing about 30 minutes of conversation with the filmmakers. After that, we'll have 15 minutes or so for questions from the audience. So if you do have a question, please use the Q and A module at the bottom of your screen and I'll be collecting those. I also, since this is our closing film, I wanna express deep thanks to all of our funders, our, the members of both organizations, um, anyone who uh, watched a film and all of you joining us for this discussion. It's, um, it certainly has been different having a virtual film festival, but um, we're really pleased that people responded and we're really pleased to share uh, wonderful films, wonderful work like Irmi. So um, welcome Veronica and welcome Susan. I'm gonna start with some um, general questions. Maybe you could tell us, start out by telling us how the idea to actually make a film came about. Well, I'll, I'll start about Irmi. <laughs> um, well, I, I had the idea. Um, it was really, it was unformed, I have to say. And the way it began is that um, over time I've shot footage of Irmi and, and um, about, about, about 10 years after she died, actually, I started to work with that material principally because I really missed her and I wanted to just be with her in that way. <laughs> but, and so I cut little sequences, but it, it didn't shape into a film. And a dear friend of mine, Rob Epstein, suggested that I use Ermi's memoir as a narrative thread, which had not occurred to me. So from the moment that that idea came up, uh, I did have a sense of structure for the film. And, and I, began, I began cutting. Um, I, I, knew, I knew very early on that I wouldn't be making this film without Susan. She didn't know that yet, but I knew it. <laughs> and, uh, so when the time was, was right, when I'd done enough on my own, I uh, enlisted Susan and, and that's how the film got made. And, and it, did, it did satisfy, just to, just to complete that thought, it certainly satisfied um, the, the desire to spend time with Ermi because we spent a lot of time on this film. That's wonderful. I, I think watching the film, you really feel like it comes from love, that it, it's not just a, um, yeah, a, let's say standard documentary, but that there's a lot of love in the project. Um, you've worked together before on previous films, is that right? That's right, that's right. We worked together, well, well, for one, we've been friends for so very, very many years. And we've looked at each other's work over time because we're both in film in parallel careers. But we did work together on a film about, uh, a film that I, that I uh, produced and directed about um, a radio station in Berkeley, the first, the first listener-sponsored radio station in the country, in the world perhaps, called, uh, called um, KPFA, part of Pacifica. And, and uh, I actually brought that film to New York so that, I could, so that Susan could cut it with me, so that she cut it, she made it with me really. And I brought it to New York for that purpose. 
I've noticed that you, you've both done quite a lot of work in editing and the film is so superbly edited um, visually and, and sound wise. Um, Susan, what was it like for you working with this material? Um, well, it was, it was very pleasurable actually. Um, both because um, I did know Ermi um, for a number of years. Veronica and I have known each other since high school. So um, I met Ermi when I was 15 years old and spent a lot of time with her. She, however, um, the pleasure of the film came somewhat from being close to the subject, but it also came from the discoveries around the material and the fact that I was collaborating with a very close friend and that, um, you know, it was just sort of an unusual project that brought together a lot of, a lot of things in my own life, in Veronica's life. And there was a lot, a lot to go through as a process that was, as I said, very pleasurable. And Not all you... films are pleasurable in the making. I would say. <laughs> my Wonderful. And can you tell us about, um, so in addition to footage and family photographs, you know, some wonderful material, um, there's also, there are also animated drawings and there's um, a lot of artwork. So maybe you could both talk about your process a little bit when you decided to use those elements and how you worked with um, how you work them in so um, fluidly. Well, what, what, just one thing I want to say about the animated uh, drawings, which is that sometimes solutions come out of what initially seems seem like problems. And and once we we understood that we wanted to to start the film in in Ermi's apartment, the first thing we did was look for footage, look for images that would fulfill that that need, and we really didn't find anything that was adequate. So it was Susan's idea to animate. Let's, let's animate those things because we don't have the material we need. And that's how we found an animator and uh, started to work with, with her. She's, she's French, so um, she's over there. <laughs> but she was here in San Francisco at the time, and. And the three of us worked on 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 the on the concept of the drawings, and um, that's how that that's how that happened. Actually, there's there's one thing that Veronica's leaving out because it wasn't so um, abstract as an idea. We were we we um, Veronica interviewed a, a, a friend who um, is an artist and. She had an incredible um, way of being able to visualize Ermi's apartment, and so she she described it, you know, as if you she just she used words and and she sort of brought us into the apartment and through her, um, you know. So in a way, we had a soundtrack, um, and the soundtrack was so inviting. It brought you know it was selective. It brought together cert certain things that she remembered that were so true to the, to the space that it was almost like you were inhabiting it, listening to her. And um, that really was the um, inspiration for wanting to find the images to, to go with her description. So it was sort of a, an evolution from, and of course we, we both felt that, that Ermi's sense of of space and the way she animated a space herself was so revealing of who she was and of her life. So it wasn't just to be, um, um, I mean, it, it had a, a profound uh, reason behind going through all that trouble to animate it. We really felt it, it brought you into an essential thing about this person's spirit. One thing I'd like to add to that, if I might, which is that that it obviously all these, you know, it's a process. Making a movie is a process, and one of the things that happened in the course of that is that we decided that it made more sense for me as the 
filmmaker, daughter of my mother, to introduce the apartment. So it's my voice. So we replaced, we used some of, some of our friend Lucy's descriptions in the drawings, but we used my narration then to be in my voice coming into Jeremy's apartment. <laughs> well, and it, it works so wonderfully as an, as an opener for the film because um, it, it has such a welcoming and inviting feeling. And you, as a viewer, I felt like I was being welcomed to the story. Um, uh, it, it, the, the memoirs are incredible. Um, you know, such detail and so, um, so beautifully written and so, um, you know, full of kind of emotion and wonder. And of course, um, having the great actress, Hannah Shagula as uh, uh, reading the memoirs is, is very, very powerful. Um, how, did, how did she come to the project or how did you approach her? Well, she came, she came to the project, um, she came to the project because we we worked with with a wonderful wonderful American actress um, who read the the text both with her American accent and then read the text with uh, a German accent which was not hers but she is an actress and she put she read it that way but for both Susan and I it just seemed clear that with that experiment behind us. For that experience, we needed we needed somebody who had an authentic, genuine German accent uh, to to do the reading, and um, uh, I, I I I thought of Hannah Shigula. It seemed like a stretch, but uh, we were able to reach her and um, emailed her and told her about the project just in the email, and and she was just you know just beautifully responsive and said she be interested. And so she uh, lives in Paris. I was in Paris. I brought the uh, memoir to her. She read it and she said, I'm, I want to do it. And then I went back a year later to record her professionally. But that very first time that we met, she read through the memoir and just was, was just totally with it. I, I want to just add something, which is that it's meaningful for her too. It wasn't just just yet another you know fine thing for her to do, but the fact that it was the experience uh, and the memoir of a of a German Jewish woman was was significant to Hannah. She wanted to contribute to that story, and um, it's in that spirit that she brought herself to it. Uh, I would say, what, what do you think, Susan? Yeah, I mean, I, Veronica had that, like her mother, she had a bee in her bonnet about Hannah Shibula and um, somehow without ever having any contact with her, felt that not only would she be the right person, but that she would do it. <laughs> and um, it took a while. Yeah, I, I think that for a long time, that was who you thought should should be the narrator. And somehow when it happened and the connection got made, it, it just seemed to be part of the part of the fate of the film to um, include her. And has the film been shown in Germany yet? No, it hasn't. And actually, unfortunately, we were not invited to the Berlin Film Festival. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what the complications were this year, but they were extremely gracious in their saying that the film would not be showing. But there's, of course, the Berlin Jewish Film Festival. I say, of course, I, I don't mean that. To, uh, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful festival and we've already been approached. And so it will come to Berlin. But not in that, not in the, in, not in that festival. Sure. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about the research that you did, um, finding archival material. And I'll pull a question from the audience um, that's related. How did Ermi get a copy 
of the photos of her first apartment with her husband in Germany, all the beautifully made furniture. It really is spectacular. Well, I, I'll answer that, although both of us know the, the answer to that. And, and it's actually the answer is, is in past, but it's in the film, which is that they had a spectacular apartment early in her first husband, Carl. And, and they had a very established, very well-known back then designer uh, do the furniture and just that's a, the, the doors, you know, just an extraordinary place. And as a, as a thank you, uh, Carl, Hermes' husband, made an album. He had professional photos done and he made a beautiful album for the designer. And which the designer had. When Ermi lost everything, uh, the designer got in touch with Ermi. He found a way to be in touch with her and he sent her the album. So we have the album and it's, it's with that that we were able to scan the photos and use them in the film. Does that yeah, answer? Yeah, that's, it's such a wonderful story. Um, and the other archival research that you did, um, well, first, I, I, there must have been a lot of work in um, the family, I don't know, archive, repository, shoebox, however it, um, however it is. Um, were you, did you know the extent to which you, you had this kind of material, photographs and such? Well, we, we, we did have quite a bit. We did have quite a bit, but we also have, we also have relatives. Ermi had, had uh, several, several nephews at the time that were still alive. We just have one cousin, cousin, cousin Erwin. And so the photos came from, from other members of the family as well. And, and uh, again, again, when, when Ermi was left alone, uh, many people sent things to her so that she had a really, really wonderful repository of images that she would not normally have had, but that were, that came to her, you know, the way you send pictures to family members, there were quite a few, quite a few of those that came into the, in, into the, into the family archive, as you say. And so we had a rich store of those. My sister had a lot of them and that's how we got them all. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, one of the, I, I just wanted to add that one of the um, delightful sequences in the film has to do with um, their time in France and the beautiful home movies that are actually shot in 16 millimeter. Um, and and what isn't what isn't revealed in the film, you know, with their, that that footage is just part of the storytelling. But actually, Ermi produced that little film for um, her husband who, for his 50th birthday, it was a surprise. And she actually found a crew and hired a crew um, and, 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 and made this delightful. I mean, it was without sound, it was, but it was very beautiful and it wasn't fully edited. It was just sort of one scene after another, but the footage was beautiful and for, I don't think anybody in the family had ever really seen it or appreciated it. Veronica had to take it to a professional place to have it kind of um, specially transferred so that it wasn't damaged. Anyway, that was sort of a remarkable little jewel in the film, I thought. Yeah, it's very, it's very warm, has a very warm feeling to it. Um, and other archival research, did you come across anything surprising um, when you were looking for historical material or? Well, we, we worked with an archivist, a wonderful ar archivist, Rachel Antel out here. Um, but we, uh, you know, we looked, Susan, Susan looked at a lot of material. We looked at a lot of material on the internet um, and found, found a lot, you know, one of the surprises that both Susan and I have had and expressed to each other is that, that some of the, the footage that we found was very new to us, very new to us. And, and uh, subsequently we have seen some of it used quite a bit <laughs> in other films, you know, the, the Juden 
you know, be careful with the with the with the skull and and cross so that that's been that's been in other films. But we did extensive. Uh, Rachel did just extensive research, and and the material comes from archives from about five four countries, at least four countries, um, and and um, I don't know. Susan was very adept at looking for things, and some some of it are these beautiful colored stills from the from the early 1900s that we used going to a spa in Germany. It's a it's 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 a profession to find archival material, and we work with a, with a professional as well as our own instincts. And do you want to add something, Suze? No, I mean you know obviously when we were looking, we were looking for things that were unusual, you know, um, and that caught our um, imaginations and fit the storytelling. Um, and some things were hard to find, and some things just popped into place, like like those. So those spa images that were so right for that part of the story, they came from the New York Public Library of all places. I mean, um, beautiful. I mean, I don't know how many people have seen them, but um, actually I didn't find them on my own. You know, somebody else who was also an archivist sort of led us to that, that location. It is, a, it is a profession finding these wonderful things in different places all over the world, it's amazing. Absolutely. Um, I'm gonna pull a question from the audience about the, what um, this viewer says, most likely it was a difficult editing process. Can you tell us about some of the interviews that might not have made it into the film? Oh yeah, there were several. Um, That's always sad, I can assure you of that. <laughs> mm. yeah. Maybe you'll put an extras reel together. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. I mean, some of them I don't miss anymore, but some some I do. Um, there's just a certain amount of storytelling that you can do in one film. And um, I remember about a year before we actually locked the picture, we had a screening for a number of filmmakers. Um, and it was in that screening that we, you know, were told no, that's too much, that's too much, that's too much. And so we had to kind of take a good look at some of that material that we loved, but really the film is better for having taken it away and it involved, you know, a, a, a bit too many characters. I think that's, that would be the, 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 the most direct answer is that we had we had too many people and we had too many people concentrated at the end of the film because we told our film, in the, ultimately we told it chronologically and we had a cluster of people who came in later in Ernie's life and they, there were too many of them at that point and they're the ones in large part that we had to lose even though we, we love them dearly. <laughs> sure. Well, I can imagine it, it must have been tempting to, one could follow so many threads um, uh, in, her, in her story. And um, in addition to having a life well lived, I feel like she had several lives um, well lived and so full, of, so full of events. There are a couple of questions on this note asking um, like what happened to Ermi's brother and sister and nephew. Er Ermi's, Ermi's sister who was married and um, her husband, this is, this is of course family lore because, but her husband did not want to leave Germany. He felt that it would um, pass through, this would, and, and he and Ermi's sister and Ermi's brother-in-law, Ermi's sister, her, her husband and her son were, died in Auschwitz. That um, is one set. The, all the other, the, the, the one, and one brother was a young man who died in World War I. The other brothers all made it, to, uh, two made it to, one made it to America, one went to Palestine, which then became Israel, went to Palestine. 
the, the oldest brother. One brother was in concentration camp in Holland and he survived. Um, and then the, the fourth brother was on the boat with Ernie and he perished on the boat. That's all the siblings. Sure. Um, and then the Ermi's nephew who provides so much background, how did he leave Germany? He left, Ermi's, Ermi's nephew left Germany as a 13 year old boy with his parents. Uh, and they went, they, they, they were the ones who were the first ones to go to Holland. As soon as Kristallnacht happened, they called Ermi, their sister in, in Holland, Ermi and Carl, and Ermi and Carl got, got them out of Germany, so to speak. They, they provided the finances to get them out. They, they got them to Holland. And from Holland, they went, it's that family, it's Ermi's oldest brother with his wife and two children, 13 and younger, who went to Palestine. And my, my cousin, Erwin, who's in the film and provides so much background, it now lives in America, but he, he was raised in Germany and then in, in, in Palestine, Israel, and came to America in the early 50s and settled there. And he's alive and well. He's uh, uh, in, 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 in New York, in New York State. I don't know, maybe he's watching. <laughs> Great. And, um... You know, we're just, I want to share that there are quite a few comments thanking you for, for the beautiful film. Um, and I actually, um, I want to share with you that when we, on our selection team, when we were um, discussing the films that we had selected, including Ermi and, you know, what film we would close the festival with, um, we really felt like in a, a time, a moment such as this in the world that a story of resilience was very, very important um, and that people would appreciate as we did um, learning about a resilient person and a, a, a very strong woman. So, um, you know, we, as, an, as a viewer, we, as viewers, we just felt like you had done an enormous um, good deed for the world by sharing Ermi's story out. Um, yeah, it, it's, um, is there anything you can, I, I guess I, I was curious to know if um, Ermi, her resilience was something that she was aware of and wanted to sort of talk about or if it was just an inter integral part of her personality. Do, do you know what I mean? Actually, I, 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 want, I want to answer that for, for one reason, which is that I've, I've thought about that actually. It, it, uh, one of the things that's happened in the course of making the film and viewing it, and, uh, I, came to, I came to learn some things about Ermi that I didn't know really, or came to understand some things that I hadn't before. It's just sort of the virtue of spending so much time in, in a different way with Ermi. Um, and I was looking at the film very recently and I thought about the parties on the cake, which occur at the end of the film more or less, and how people really loved her. She was really a beloved person. And I thought about why, why, why would that be? And, and I think that that part of what, what shaped Ermi, even though of course I didn't know her before and a lot of who she was came with her, but I do think that part of what, what shaped her was her, her terrible loss and her, her, her ability, her getting, getting through it, integrating it, somehow having it live within her and her life continue. I think she, without, Absolutely, I thought about understanding what she what she brought. I think that 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 loss shaped something in her that she was able to project without knowing. And one of the things was, I think, just her her sense of what was important, what what 
what what mattered in in communicating with people, what mattered in the exchange with others, and um, just a kind of generosity of spirit, I think, that did develop as part of who she became. Um, that was my sense that without knowing it, she she was shaped in 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 ways that that strengthened her, if I can put it that way. Did, did you experience anything like that, Susan? I was, I thought about it a lot, you know, um, because Ermi's um, Ermi's strength as a personality um, wasn't felt so much. I mean, she, she, her, her strength did lie in a certain kind of um, resilience, but you didn't experience it as resilience per se. When you were encountering, encountering her, she, this, what Veronica was talking about, this generosity of spirit really had, had had a way of opening up to each moment and each person that came into her into her field, and kind of bestowing them with a fullness of her presence. Um, it 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 didn't come across as her um, kind of telling you who she was, but really receiving who you were. And it kind of set up a dynamic that you, that was very consistent. I think she made people feel very special and very loved. And, and um, that this moment that we're in now is just so alive. And, that's, and that's, that's a kind of, a different kind of resilience than somebody who comes into a situation with a sense of strength. She, it's hard to describe really. But, but yet, we both, I think, as we were making the film, were aware of this, of this resilience and talked about where it might come from and how it, how it expressed itself in her life. Yeah, yeah what, what you're saying about her being open and sort of receiving people um, from where they were coming from, it so, comes across so beautifully in the film. Uh, I love the interviews with friends who, you know, years later, their faces would light up or that when they were expressing concern, you know, it, it was clear um, that she was very, very dear to them. Um, how, how did you track down the, the friends or people from the past? Um, well, Ermi had had a quality too, which is that she maintained connections. I mean, to just to give an example, that's not, uh, but but Ermi's first family, the 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 siblings of of Carl, they were they were like aunts and uncles to us. Mm. So so she it brought in um, her first family to us, and she was she she was extraordinary in maintaining connections. And so they were people in our lives. They were, they were um, somebody who's not in the film, just to say, uh, because sometimes the question comes up is that at when, when Ermi married in, in, uh, in England and there were two boys, two, two, little, two, little, two young boys in that, in that marriage and that marriage ended in, in New York, Ermi maintained relationships with those two boys. She, she, found them again as adults. And so, so um, that's how it happened. They were never rediscovered, so to speak. They were always there. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. Yeah, so in other words, it, hearing about Ermi's um, first marriage family was not a, a big shock. It was something that you knew about and was part of your family life in a way. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a related question of whether um, Ermi spoke to you, Veronica, growing up about the really difficult um, 
parts of her of her story of her past no no and and that's one of the things that um again that i i was able to experience more fully in the film than than in 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 any outspoken way with with her. I mean, uh, Irene and I, my, my sister Irene and I, Irene was wonderful in the film. I, Irene and I, ever since we were born, knew knew, knew about about Ermi's loss. But I can't even say how we knew it. We simply knew it, and and we we were so so determined in. Uh, unconsciously, that's all I can say, unspokenly, to, uh, to, to avoid sadness for Ermi. And so we really never, never explored what happened. We never gave Ermi the opportunity to talk about it because we so avoided it. And Ermi, neither did Ermi uh, come forth with all of that. So it was really um, something that I learned something that opened up for me in the making of the film, just how much pain she did, she did live with and absorb. Um, Irene might have a different way of saying it, but we were both very, very adamant <laughs> uh, to avoid that part of Ernie's hurt. And maybe it was a mistake because we never really spoke about it. There's a question asking if you could say a bit more about the serendipitous encounter with the young Dutch woman um, who lived on the same street and was a classmate of Ermi's son. That is an extraordinary story yeah, that you tell in the film. Uh, yes, well, I can, I can um, add this to it, which is that um, it, it makes me emotional <laughs> for whatever reason, but... Um, <laughs> When we got to Paris, when we got, we got home and the young Dutch couple left, that next weekend, the mother of the daughter came to visit us. In other words, it was, it was such, a, such a shock and extraordinary event for both sides that, as I say, the young woman went back to Holland and her mother flew to Versailles where we lived to spend the weekend with us or some days with us to just be together. Um, it, it was, you know, it was just one of those, I mean, it was an extraordinary occurrence. Um, I think for, I think for, for all, all of us, for all of us, I think both for Irene and me too, where we had really the most tangible evidence of the life of this child, um, that we never knew, but it was so tangible to see someone who did, who had known that child as a child. Um, it was, it, it was just, it was, you know, I think I, Irene describes it really well. It was extraordinary and Ermi really did just pull over and just break the car and just, you know, take it in, turned around, took it in. Uh, one of the things that 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 um, that I know that people have said about Ermi, and, and certainly her, we all have, is she she coincidences occurred for her. This was an extraordinary coincidence, but she had others that were just unusual. And she this was an extraordinary one. I don't know what more to say about it except that, as I say, the mother of the daughter of the young young bride came to see us in Versailles. Beautiful. Um, a viewer is wondering what language did the family speak together when you lived in France? Um, our dad spoke to us in English. Irene and I forgot English in three months it was, it was gone because we went to French school right away and we were six years in French school, we spoke French. And our mother, uh, who was more flexible than our dad, uh, spoke to us in French. But our dad wanted us to um, hear English 
which which we did, of course. There were American friends who were part of the JDC, so we heard English, but we didn't we didn't speak it um, until we went to the American school in Paris uh, when sixth grade, seventh grade, then we began. And our parents did not speak German together unless they didn't want us to understand something because they were, my father was extremely, 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 I don't know if bitter is the right word, but he did not want to have anything to do with Germany or Germans or the language. Um, who, who was the, a viewer is asking, who was the artist whose work was bought by the Tel Aviv Museum of Art? We think it's Jacob Steinhardt. Okay. Okay. We can take a couple of more questions if um, people would like to use the Q&A module. That's the best way to pose the questions. And just give me a second. I'm scrolling through to make sure we've gotten all of them more um, warm wishes. Thank you for the beautiful film. Uh, okay. Great. Um, what are the plans for other screenings of the film? I, I know that you were in the San Francisco Jewish Film Festival that um, Well, we have, go ahead, Suze. Yeah, well, we, we've entered the film into a, a couple of festivals that we haven't heard from um, yet. And it will be shown in the Miami Jewish Film Festival. And, um, and we hope to, you know, arrange for other screenings of the film. These days it's hard because it has to do with being able to connect with organizations that are set up virtually. And um, so we're still in the process of finding our way in this new landscape and, and actually hoping that we can envision a time when we can show the film to a live audience. That's never happened since we finished the film. I've never seen the film on a screen, you know, other than my computer. And um, I'm really looking forward to that. So yeah, I, th all... I think we're all looking forward to in-person <laughs> film festivals. Um, yeah. But it yeah. is, I, I should, I, 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 I do want to say that we feel we kind of hit the jackpot when we got to New York and we were in San Francisco. So we had, we so, <laughs> so pleased and honored, really. No, so we, the honor is ours. Um, Okay, question. Your, your father's career was very interesting. Can you tell us a little bit more about his career, Veronica? Um, well, my father was, was an educator. This is what he, you know, I don't, I don't know. But, but yes, I, I would have to say he was an educator. I'm not sure exactly what kind of degree one gets for that. But when he was in, when he was in Germany, he, he, had, he was the director of the Lotte Kaliski School, which was a school for Jewish children. And it was a school for Jewish children that was started before the, uh, before the exclusion of Jewish kids from other schools, but it, um, it, and it became very much that at the time that my father was the director of it, which was in the, in the early thirties, uh, it was already beginning to be clear that Jewish children were not welcome in other schools. Um, he, was he came to America, the school was, was closed. Um, he, he came to America and he felt that, uh, well, he, he, and he got a social work degree, but he, he was again, a kind of educator, I suppose, because what he did with his social work degree was he, he became the director of homes for for Jewish children in America, both in, uh, at the time there were foster homes for Jewish children. I, I don't know if that still exists, but he was the director of one in Chicago. He was the director of one in Newark. He was the director of one in Pleasantville, New York. And when he got the, when he was offered the job uh, in, um, in Versailles, 
in France from the JDC, it was to be the director. And again, sort of an educator, sort of organize the educational program for the students that came. And that's really what he, what he, what he did, what he was. He, and and uh, he died, he died in that, in that position. He would have liked to, uh, he would have, he very much wanted the school to go to, to go to Israel. Uh, he would have liked to go to Israel. He, he would have liked to be going there with it and be the director, but he died before that happened. The school did go to Israel and is still a functioning part of the Jerusalem, the university. Hmm. Fascinating. Uh, uh, a viewer says, well, you mentioned that it took a long time to make the film. This viewer is asking, did your beautiful mom have a chance to see parts of it? No, she didn't. <laughs> and you know, it's funny because, because um, my mother was in her, in her own way, very modest. Hmm. And, um, you know, she, she, she would just be like, so it's incredulous that this happened. <laughs> but she didn't get a chance to see it. And I don't even think that she watched uh, any little moments of filming that I did with her or that Irene did with her. Um, but... Um, Uh, another audience question is, can you tell us about Fred Bauman? Uh, is he in the U.S., for example? Fred Bauman is in the U.S. Fred Bauman was in the U.S. because Fred died. Oh, sorry. Fred died about two months ago. Yeah. Uh, yes, he was, he was in the U.S. You know, one of the things that happens in the film is that, you know, suddenly the victors are in England, uh, people are in America. There was so much moving, you know, they... They, people started in Germany, they went to Holland. From Holland, they went to England. From England, they went to Cuba or to, or, or to the Dominican Republic. Then they came to the United States and Fred Bauman, it was the same thing. They were Germans, they came to London. His family was in London when Ermi arrived in, in London. He then came to America and was a photojournalist in uh, California. Um, and, uh, Yes, he was an American, but he was unfortunate. Um, one viewer is asking, uh, is saying it was alluded to that Irmi was a lonely person, but compensated by trying not to be alone, um, always being with friends or family. Do you think this might be what saved her? She processed events amazingly. I think that Ermi relied deeply, and if, I don't know if relied is exactly the right word, but let's use it anyway, on, on the, uh, what, you know, the kindness of others, on the, on the generosity of others, on the, oh, on the willingness of others to take her in. I mean, this is something that was absolutely crucial to her survival. It was crucial from the moment the, 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 the train that took from the, you know, from the boat to the train to London, it was really the, just the inclusion of others that made, that, that helped her survive fully. And that was, that was always, always true. She had a tremendous, tremendous need and enjoyment of others. Um, I don't know, that doesn't answer the question, uh, but She loved being with, me. even though she lived alone for so many, many, many years. That is to say, after our dad died, after we left home, after my sister and I left home, she never lived with anyone again. She never remarried. But that's why she loved the house on the Cape. People were there all the time. Well, we're going to wrap up in a few moments, but I will also tell you that questions are coming in about when can the film be seen again and when can people in Europe see it and will it be available to rent on Netflix? I know it's a difficult question to answer in the current situation that we're in. Um,
but uh, people really do want to know when it will be widely available. Uh, so do we. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. The life of a film is, well, in regular times, we would say you're on the festival circuit now and making plans. <laughs> well, we have one screening in New York that we know about um, in the future, and that's um, at the the film series at the uh, JDC. Oh, great. JCC, JCC, you mean. The JCC, sorry. I'm getting my alphabet mixed up here. But um, that will be, I'm sure that they'll advertise it. And they have a wonderful ongoing film program that's now virtual. Um, and, that, and, and they're talking to us about scheduling it in um, April, I believe, early April. So. Oh, that's great. Yes, we, we work with the JCC Manhattan, they do have great film programs. And I'm sure if people check their website, um, it'll pop up soon. That's well, just great may, to hear. May I add one more thing? Uh, of course. There's one more thing I want to add something because I, 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 want to, I want to stress really the collaborative nature of this film, which is that um, uh, it was just so deeply collaborative and, and there, 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 there would not be a film without Susan. <laughs> so even though it's so you know so focused on on of course our our family and and my you know my mother's experience it's uh, such a such a uh, a work of, of the two of us and you know what what Susan brought to it is just uh, so enormous I just want to say that if ever you are anybody out there thinking of making a film about your family <laughs> <laughs> enlist, enlist a very, very special insider outsider and filmmaker. <laughs> uh, that's, that's wonderful. Well, I think we'll wrap up with that. So let me thank you both so very much for this beautiful, beautiful film and for a very interesting and lovely hour of conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care.